you will find in my um, speech today themes of obviously I'm building a city, so urbanism. But really, it's a story about entrepreneurship. It's a story about persistence, about innovation, about risk taking, a little bit of leadership, and personal growth. But before I start the narrative, every story needs a motive. So I, I was shocked when I looked at this picture. What do you see? It's moving. <laughs> this picture, not the other one. <laughs> what do you see? When I first looked at it, how much risk are these guys taking? So dangerous, right? Really unbelievable what they're trying to do. And I thought, God, what are these guys doing with their future? But then, when you really stare at it, some new meaning emerges. If you look at this, there is, you know what they're doing? It's called sidewalk skiing. Okay, it's a stunt. These guys get in the car, there's a fourth one driving, so four guys get in a car. They get the car to speed, get it to balance on two tires, and then they get out of the car, start removing the tires from the back and the front and switching them. And then they all go back into the car and they rebalance it. <laughs> Just go to Jeffy Lou, I don't know why you're doing this. But to get there, to get there, and here's my point, you need persistence, you need training, teamwork. There's almost a level of perfecting your vocation. And the moral of the story is the following. These are very talented people. They just chose this to spend their talents on. Frankly, because there is very little else. This is, by the way, is not a Saudi story. There are 600 million people around the world that will need jobs over the next 10 years. It's an Arab world story, but it's also a global story. It's an emerging market story. And we can't use old methods, old formulas, and expect new results. And governments around the world have unfortunately been trying to do just that trying to do more of the same thing. It is time for innovation in public-private partnership. Saudi Arabia, despite having huge oil reserves and big financial capacity, tried to do just that. The late King Abdullah in 2005, just five months, by the way, after he, was, he became king, launched a new project. It's a brand new city from scratch for two million people. Physically, it is the size of Washington, D.C., so very sizable. And the idea was, for the first time, the government of Saudi Arabia knows how to build cities. They built Jubail and Yambar. These are new industrial cities that we launched 35 years ago. But the idea here is for the government to take, to take a back seat and give the private sector the opportunity to lead. That was the idea. So for the first time, in global history, a project of this size was given to the private sector. It is prob pra practically today the largest private sector project in the world, a price tag of $100 billion. What's more interesting, it was also a startup because there was no company, no team, and it was listed day one. So every kind of complication you can imagine was put right here. So, I joined this initiative in 2008, January 2008, about two years after it was launched. And I have, had never built anything before. I was 30 years old, just uh, three years after graduating. 
from Stanford. My only training in this was actually SimCity. <laughs> How many of you played SimCity? Come on, be honest. Raise your hands so you're all qualified to do my job. <laughs> and I did it, by the way, by coincidence. I, was, uh, um, I, I had a hard time keeping up uh, in class. Uh, so uh, I spent my sophomore year of college playing SimCity. And that was my training. Actually, it turned out to be good training because all of my uh, cities as mayor of these sim cities failed and went bankrupt. But I have experience. <laughs> and one of the things I learned very early on on the job is that this is a really, really competitive space. In fact, there are 248,000 cities around the world. 248,000 cities. And each one of them is a unique product. They all compete for us to move there and for companies to set up. So you really, you really as a city, need to have a clear strategy. You really need to know where you're going to be when you grow up. And we decided that this is going to be a global logistics and manufacturing hub. Why? Two reasons. Number one, the city is located on the Red Sea where 23% of global trade goes. 23%, almost a quarter of global trade, east to west, comes through the Red Sea. But there is no significant port that can actually address this market and provide the logistics required for it. That's one. The second um, idea is very simple, but even less well known. You see this area, all of these countries around the Red Sea? This is what we call the Red Sea region. There are 650 million people living there today. Countries growing at anywhere between 6 to 12% in terms of GDP. Not bad, right? Good market. But it, by 2050, this market will be 1.3 billion people. So this is, as a region, it is the next China in terms of potential. So if you are a global corporate, you can't address all of these countries by being located in all of them. You need economies of scale. So the idea is we established Saudi Arabia through King Abdullah Economic City as a hub for these companies. That's the basic idea. And so we created this master plan. The master plan has a port, a mega port. It's going to be amongst the top 10 ports in the world. An industrial zone. So let me see if I can point with this. Can I point with this? Yes, there you go. Innovation. One of the largest industrial zones in the region. And then residential, commercial, and other developments all over the rest of the city. So you see these colors are all of the communities right now, the residential communities we're building, and there is a high-speed railway connecting us with the largest three, th uh, three cities in the region, Mecca, Medina, and Jeddah. So about 10 million people that can get here within less than an hour. Good market. And that was the vision. This, this was it. So where are we now, nine years later? As of today, we have a port that is 2.7 million container capacity. By next year, we'll have the largest port in Saudi Arabia. Definitely the largest on the Red Sea. Fully privatized port, by the way. And these cranes are the tallest in the world. And because we want to engage the communities around us, we have trained people from villages around us. In fact, the port operating room today has 90 women, exclusively women, from villages around us. They actually tell all of the boys where to put the containers. So that's the port. We also have one of the most successful industrial zones in the region. Definitely in Saudi Arabia, it is the most successful non-oil based industrial zone. We have attracted, uh, attracted companies from around the world, including Mars, Sanofi, uh, Pfizer, and others. Many of them are establishing manufacturing facilities in the kingdom for the first time but some, some of them are in the region for the first time. 
again creating jobs. And this was the second most important learning, that resident, uh, residential developments actually do not create economic development. You know, when, when you have developers go into a city to develop real estate, what they're doing is tapping to an economic cycle that already exists. There are jobs, and they are simply providing residency, right? So we have learned that this does not work. And therefore, we've created the jobs, and then we had to create the developments that will try to accommodate um, the, the jobs that we, and the people that are moving in for the jobs. So we created different income segment uh, solutions. So we have, as you can see, six different um, communities, each one of them addressing a different income segment. So we have all the way from labor villages all the way to high end. You can see golf courses, uh, etc. there. But we introduced two interesting ideas into the mix. First of all, equity in terms of providing all amenities within every community. So every community has the same level of amenities. So all of them have some kind of beach access, some public amenities and facilities, and even some level of education, even professional continuing education. And the second is we staggered them. So they're actually uh, distinct but staggered. So you can actually move from each one to the other as your career grows. So the idea is you graduate, start, you get a job, you start earning um, income, you invest in your equity in your home very quickly on, and you have then mobility within the community moving from one to the other. And in fact, because of this strategy, last year, although this is a completely new development, we became the largest developer in terms of sales in the country. We've sold 2,500 units more than anybody else in the country. And one of the things that I also learned is on the importance of education. They say to build a great city, all you need to do is build a great university and wait 200 years. <laughs> I don't have 200 years. Um, so the idea is, the idea is to bring education as much as possible to the beginning of the city development. So we're building K through 12 schools. This is our first school. It's actually a very successful school. It will have the first also boarding component in the country so we can board students. Uh, we're working with Babson on a college of entrepreneurship and business. And we are doing a lot of training for, you know, 90-day based training, just rehabilitation post-schooling. Uh, post so we have a lot of high school graduates in the region. We've trained a thousand of them, just 90 days. And these are, if you think about the opportunities that we have, we are basically in the mainstream, right? We already are, you're already very successful, you're going to a great school, the employers come to you, you have family members, you have friends, a network, right? But if you're in a village and you graduated from high school and your parents are not employed, you absolutely have no access to the market. In fact, many of these students in these villages, or these, these five, six-year six graduates post high school, had no access to the job market. They can't even know, they don't even know where to look for a job. They don't know how to write a resume. They don't know how to interview. So that's all we did. We did 90 days of training, English, career management, computer skills, etc. 90 days. What do you think was the success rate? Throw a number, percent. 45. Risk takers, I like that. I like it. It was 88 percent. 88 percent of the graduates of this program either got a job, went into higher education, and 11 percent of them actually started their own companies. So again, it's about doing the little things that matter the most. Okay, so this is, this is something I'm super, super excited about. Saudi Arabia is not known for, to be a great tourist destination, right? So we're actually going heavily into tourism. You know, you, get, you build the largest port, the most successful industrial zone, you become the largest residential developer, and it gets to your head. They say, okay, we're going to do tourism. So how do you think we're going to do it? 
how can we compete with Dubai, Paris, San Francisco, all of these great places that attract millions and millions of people to them? Any ideas? Exactly. We don't have to. We are the 17th most visited country in the world. Every year also, in addition to that, we export 10 million Saudis around the world. On vacation. On vacation, 30 days. So we're trying to create a location within Saudi Arabia that leverages the incredible location we are in. In fact, here is a taste. We have some of the most beautiful coral reefs in the world, 6,000 years old, almost 5,000 species, many of them unique. 44 are sharks, but we don't talk about it because it's not good for tourism. <laughs> and in creating a destination, you need to leverage the space you are. You need a sense of place, right? So leveraging the 50 kilometers or 35 miles of seafront is one. The second is because we live in the GCC and the temperature is quite hot all year round, we've gotten used to air conditioning. So we hardly leave our homes. We have hardly have, um, you know, uh, being an environment where I can walk out of here and into the street is, is actually quite unique and wonderful. And that's why we all love the Bay Area. In fact, 50% of you won't leave this area. But the idea is how can we create a city that will allow you to re-engage with the environment? So we did something that is very interesting. It was part of my learning as well. The first master plan, which you didn't see, this is the second, uh, this is the fourth master plan, but the first master plan made the city look like Venice. It was beautiful. It was almost 50 miles of waterways inside the city, okay? And I learned that that is the most harmful thing you can do to the environment and to the city. Simply it was over-engineered, but that's the way you built cities even 10 years ago, okay? So what we did is very simple. Uh, Sarah, my wife here, and I were uh, in New York during uh, Hurricane Sandy, and we got stuck. And I learned the lesson of not to go against the environment not to try to bend the environment to our will as human beings. So we went back to our master planners and we said, how can we make this the most ecologically friendly city in the world? So we removed all of the canals. We simply let the water flow where it always flowed for the past 2,000, 3,000 years and go right into the sea. And we stepped back all of our developments, about 60, 70 meters, in some areas 400 meters from the sea, we had a beautiful lagoon that was natural that we made into a preserve so nobody can touch it. And the idea is sometimes that's the right thing to do when you have a city with this kind of environment around it. But more, most importantly, it wasn't a win-lose. The city will become more appealing, but also we had even more areas to develop because it was cheaper to develop the city without the canals. So it turns out to be a win-win solution to be ecologically friendly. And I promise you, this is my final slide. So I tried to remember how wonderful it was to be here. I remember strolling back and forth, going out of my golf class, coming back to corporate finance. And just to go through this campus was unbelievable for me. And I remember that I could have almost not been here. Not at school, but what I'm doing, doing what I'm doing. In fact, I try to think about the series of steps and decisions that I made in my career. Because I can tell you, when I was there, I did not think that I would be building a city in 10 years. It was simple. There was the path of least resistance that I could have taken. I was doing really well back in the employer that I, I was working for, coming here for two years and going back. That would have been the easiest. I had a good reputation. I already built the track record. I was going to go back and do, hopefully, really well. Okay? 
but I decided to move. And it doesn't matter what decision I made at the time. What matters is how I made it. So basically what I did, I didn't say I wanted to be X, Y, and Z in 10 years. I said, here's what I want to feel like in 10 years. I want, to I want the abil ability to have influence, to produce results in the country. You know, like you, you hear the ch change uh, organizations, change the world kind of thing, you actually start believing it after two years. <laughs> and I said, I want to have impact, and it has to be positive impact. And all that. So every decision I made career-wise was, was about just getting me closer to having impact. That's what I cared about. If, you, if it's financial security that you care about, great, do that. But it's all about deciding today, just before you cement your career in any field, what should it feel like in five years, in 10 years down the line? And I think that is the biggest learning I've had over the past 10 years. Thank you so much. I'm sorry it took so long to get here, but uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. So we're going to open up for questions. Hi, uh, my name is Caroline Nowaki. I'm doing a PhD in the engineering school. Um, and I'm actually very interested in uh, development of cities by the private sector or a partnership between the public and the private sector. Um, thank you very much for this presentation. It's very inspiring. Can you talk a little more about um, what was better building this city with the private sector and not with the government, and maybe some of the challenges um, when building just with the private sector and not maybe involving um, the government as much and the public. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I think one of the biggest issues is, is um, it's a really a partnership. At the end of the day, the private sector can't do something this big on their own. It's not about the financial, it's about you know, an ecosystem. This city has to be connected with roads, with power, with it has to be part of something, right? Uh, and so uh, we leverage the, the fact that we have a partnership with the government a lot. But the challenge, obviously, with private sector leadership of this is risk. Most of the time, it was massive risks we had to take at the beginning on individual infrastructure or soft infrastructure, if you will, projects. Nobody would take any of these risks on their own, right? But when you put them together, they resulted in almost incredible risk, what we call risk on risk, right? So let me give you an example. So we're starting up. I want to build a school, right, so people can move into the city and live. So I go out and say, hey, who would build a school with me, right? And everybody would say no. Why? Because to get students, they need jobs. They need people living in the city. And so it created this kind of uh, circle, a, a vicious circle, if you will, of, of a vicious cycle of, of just what we call risk on risk. Every sector we tried to go and out and get a partner in, they said the same thing. There's demand risk, your delivery disc, uh, risk on your end, etc. And they require so much demand risk management. So you, they'll tell you, why don't you offtake you know, the 500 students? <laughs> I can't do that, right? So it was a big challenge. In fact, most of the banks wouldn't finance us, uh, us at all at the beginning, at all. Uh, and so it was a challenge to sort of focus uh, on, on which sectors do we work on. And one of the biggest mistakes we made is we tried to do too much at the beginning. You know the studentism strategy I'm talking about? It was, uh, the idea was started in 2008, but we, we couldn't pursue it at the time. It was just too much. So we went back to focus on what would actually drive jobs immediately and focus on the port, the industrial zone, and then so successively we will move into other sectors as they become ripe for it. Another question. One. Uh, I'm curious, as you, you talked a little bit about hiring local workers, yeah. um, you probably have a huge demand for talent, and I'm wondering how you think about developing local talent and hiring local versus bringing in people who know how to do the work now um, and, and what the trade-off is there. Yeah, I, I think it's about doing both. So uh, in our company, we have 24 nationalities. The idea, if you want to build a global city, you have to have global know-how. And you, have you need these networks from all around the world of technical know-how, but also social networks, so that you can attract people uh, to come here. So 
We definitely focus on attracting the best talent from around the world. Uh, but uh, ultimately, this, this city has to benefit Saudis. That's the idea behind it, right? So, uh, um, so we focus, uh, focus in a big way on attracting local talent and on training. So I talked about some of the programs uh, about bringing people back into the workforce. But we also do, for example, um, career days. I'll give you uh, one, one such um, uh, event we did in December, December 26th of last year, we did an event. So we worked with all of the employers that are now working with us, 25 of them signed up for 1,700 jobs. They opened 1,700 jobs for anybody that in, is interested. We, uh, we announced the career uh, fair online, 9 a.m. in the morning. By 11, we had 6,000 people registering. By 5, we had 12,000. By 9 p.m., we closed the registration. We had 20,000 registrant. So I thought, okay, this is, this is quantity. I'm sure there's no quality. It's just lots of people needing jobs. And then I came to the career fair, and I met with every employer. The feedback was unbelievable. They said, we've never seen so much talent in Saudi Arabia. And the reason is simple. We have 160,000 Saudi students studying now abroad and starting to graduate and go back home. And they are very, very qualified. They're studying here. They're studying in, in uh, the UK, in Europe, China, Japan, everywhere. So we're going to find a huge influx of talent coming in. And I'm, I'm very grateful that the government made this decision 10 years ago. Here and then we'll go. <laughs> Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thanks. I want to know, when you're walking through the city or waking up in the morning, what things do you see or experience that prove to you that the city is what you want it to be? And in five, ten years, what things do you hope you'll be seeing that show it's moving in the right direction? What a great question. In fact, I, I can tell you, look, this um, I've been doing this for seven years and a half, and it's been like a hundred days since then, right? My first hundred days. Uh, I work as hard, uh, as hard now as I did my first 100 days. And the reason, and it's part of the problem I'll have in the future, is it's so wonderful to go and see the work that you want to, you wa you want to do physically come out of the ground. You see people, just you know, when we have a restaurant opening in the city, it's fantastic. You see people um, coming in and experiencing, and you see this, this space and how people interact with it. And I get so much energy showing people the city. Some of you are, uh, came over for the uh, Saudi trip and came over to, to cake uh, for it, right? Some, some, some did. And uh, you know, that's the kind of experience that I love because I see the city every time anew and gives me energy for the next day and the next day and the next day. Um, so in five years, by 2020, and I don't like to have plans beyond five years because uh, you know, nobody knows what's going to happen after five years, uh, we plan on getting to a population of 50,000. We are at almost 3,000 now. We're doubling population every six months as people are moving in for their jobs, taking up residence. And 50,000 turns out to be a very important number. It is actually the number of population that is required for the city to be self-sustaining in terms of growth. You no longer need to do s induce economic development per se. It actually can grow on its own. It's enough scale. So that's my target. So thanks a lot for coming. There's a lot of us who are big geeks about cities in the room, so I'm really excited to hear this story. Um, one question is your vision for how to build a, build a city is also very unique, and I imagine there's a lot of city planners around the world and other experts who run cities, who question your philosophy. I'm just kind of curious what the most interesting conversations are that you have when you present this around the world and to others who have other ideas on how to do this that's not maybe private sector first, that's government led. And the second is more personal, kind of what from your past has been the most helpful for you, maybe besides SimCity, that got you, that, that helps you on a day-to-day -day basis envision what you want out of this project. Yeah. Uh, two very good questions. The first one also relates to which cities impact me the most in terms of seeing the, the uh, or trying to emulate. And it turns out to be two cities that started this whole thing. One is Singapore, because it's a perfect example of uh, a city-state. Sixty years ago, it's uh, sea-locked, so you don't, you know, it can't grow. 
and how they have managed not to only make it into an economic powerhouse, a trading hub, uh, but also uh, for it to be um, um, really a, a, a city that has been in constant renewal and how they manage the developments around. I think that was, that was an inspiration. In fact, uh, um, the late Lee Kuan Yew um, uh, helped us with the first master plan. We had a meeting with him and he said, look, you know, here's a, your master plan, doesn't work. And the next day he came in with, on a piece of uh, uh, paper, he said, oh, you should move the educational district here, you should move the industrial here, you should do this, do that. And uh, that was a master planning one-on-one -on -one for me. Uh, which is almost, uh, master planning is almost about logic, always about logic. Um, and the, uh, the second one is Dubai, to be honest. Dubai is a, is a, a regional example of a great success in different sectors around services, around trade, uh, becoming a trading hub, and now tourism. You wouldn't believe that Dubai could be a, a, such a great tourist destination 10 years ago, 12 years ago. So it's about what is possible. Otherwise, I, I love cities all around the world, and I find that each one of these cities has its own challenges, but it's also very unique in certain ways, and we, so we try to take from them what we think would work in a local context. And the second question, sorry, was about... Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, the most important part now is track record. When you see what, is, what you could do with very little, but just thinking very strongly about what strategy you will have for each sector, and you see that being successful, it is, and you know, it gives you such great confidence. And the second is around persistence. This might seem obvious today, but even a few years uh, ago, and the many of the Saudis in the room will tell you, uh, this was considered a joke. In fact, they used to call it uh, cartoon city. Cartoon city. Yeah. So that was the. Uh, and now it's in Saudi um, um, uh, considered the ultimate public-private partnership in a time when oil prices have dropped and, and uh, the government is looking more for private sector participation. Uh, so, thank you. I, I think I'm oh, supposed sorry. to go next. Okay, <laughs> okay it's, it's helpful to have the microphone, that way I don't have to choose and become less popular than I already am. Mine is, mine is a little bit of a follow-up to that yeah. question, which is, uh, some planned cities obviously don't have the best the reputation you yeah. alluded to um, the joke earlier. Uh, one of the reasons why when you accelerate, I guess, 800 years of history in, yes. in a decade, yes. um, it's difficult to do that without developing, I think, a large sense of hubris. So mm -hmm. I wonder, like, on your team, are there things you guys specifically do to make sure to keep yourselves in, in check with historical forces or social forces, et cetera? Yeah. Actually, this, is, this turns out to be where being private and being publicly listed most helpful. So the problem with cities that have been developed in 20 years, mostly our government, uh, master planner, usually a great architect comes up with the plan. I'm not gonna mention names because I don't wanna get into trouble. This is recorded and being. <laughs> um, but I can tell you that sometimes they forget the basics. Actually, cities are about the people, not the buildings. And people love retail. And most planners forget that retail is important. Okay, so the people that you, uh, the, some of the cities that you're talking about, literally just simply forgot to put in retail. And that's it. The buildings are fantastic. You can walk between them, but there's no place to interact, no place to sit. So it's these little examples. And I mentioned the private sector aspect and being listed for one important reason. It is a feedback mechanism. Usually when the government does something and they have a great 20-year plan, they don't have feedback. They don't get feedback. They just simply build it, right? For us being publicly listed, every quarter I have the pressure of having to show results. And you can look at results as just profit, or you can look at them as value creation. So I think the private sector, the power of the private sector is to create value, share it with your customer, and the rest is profit, right? So the more value we create, the more value we share, and profit we make. So the idea that every quarter we have to do this is actually quite powerful because it actually forces you to look at the business model and see why it's not working. It doesn't take us three years, four years, five years to figure it out. We can figure it out immediately. If something is not selling, then we know there's something wrong with it. That's why we became the
the largest developer last year because all of our product range has been very successful and that it's addressing market needs. Okay, so we have a, we have a micro, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Hi, welcome back. I'm Kent Karan, MBA One. Um, you mentioned a $100 billion price tag and I was wondering if you could comment on the private and public sources of capital, um, both past and uh, expected in the future, and if the lower oil price has led you to rescope some of the projects. Very good question. Uh, we started with the capitalization of two and a half billion dollars, trying to do a project for a hundred billion dollars, and uh, it turns out to be the biggest challenge of all, w because to build a hundred billion dollars worth of, of city, right, you need to recycle the two and a half billion dollars, which means you have to buy sell, uh, develop, sell, develop, sell, develop, sell. Um, which means you can't hold on to anything. You, you know, your prized assets. At some point, somebody interested, they pay the right price, you have to let go. So that's the biggest challenge that we have. Uh, we have been very successful lately at attracting uh, also <coughs> bank debt. I talked about the challenge of, of uh, being debt finance, which is important, but now we are at stage where the banks are offering us their balance sheets in a big way. Uh, so that is, that is quite a, a development given the, the riskiness of the project at the earlier stages. So this is it, and the idea is that, we, um, that our capitalization is sufficient going forward given that our debt to equity uh, is improving. Uh, typically in a project of infrastructure, you would have 80% debt and 20% equity. We have had 100% equity the whole time up to a um, few years back. Um, so, we still have a lot of uh, leeway to go. Thank you. Can you talk about sort of the long-term strategy for the city, whether it will be continued to be publicly listed? What does that look like in terms of your return profile or sort of what the economic aim for the city is and how that relates to managing people? You talked about how cities are about people and, and maybe yeah. that's aligned with the economic aim, maybe it's at odds, but I'm curious your reactions. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. The answer uh, is into we are now moving into separating the development from the operation of the city. So development has its own nature. You develop infrastructure, you develop buildings, you sell uh, or you rent, etc. So that's one aspect. And here, you know, it's all about creating economic value and just driving jobs, 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 and then residents, residents, residents. The operation is quite different. See, I think the operating a city should be done by the, re the residents of the city, in a sense. And so we are creating a, a whole governance structure around if you buy a unit or a home in, in the city, you get um, uh, shares in this new operating entity that will allow you to have general assemblies, vote in a uh, group of leaders, for the operation of the city and then they elect an executive or appoint an executive to lead. The most important aspect is that executive can and should be fired when they don't perform. Because ultimately the city, uh, the operation of a city is around making sure the city is safe, it's clean, etc. And that is, I, I believe, an executive job. Um, it needs, you need to have as much representation in the operation as possible, as much transparency as possible, but ultimately and it's an executive job. Um, so that's why we're separating the, the, uh, uh, the operation. Um, in terms of our return profile, we have been uh, profitable since 2011. Our growth in top line and bottom line has been 30% a year. Um, we are still doing $100 million a year on a $2.5 billion cap capitalization. Our stock is still undervalued, hint, hint. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think by, by next year or, or the year after, it will change. People will discover um, the kind of value has been created. By end of next year, we would have wiped out all of the losses that we had in the financial crisis and we'll have our land bank worth probably will be $40 billion. So. I have the mic now. Yeah, great. Uh, by the way, great presentation. Thank you so um, much. I have two questions. The first one is, um, what would be the best or the most uh, interesting opportunity right now that is not fulfilled at the city, yeah. whether it's a 
service sector or industrial sector. So if somebody would come and say, yeah. um, I want to invest, what would you recommend? What is the demand that is not fulfilled? Uh, second question is, as a, uh, can you establish a subsidiary of a foreign company to operate in, in, um, in the economic zone? Yeah, uh, the, the, the second one is easy. Yes, 100% ownership. Uh, we, o we even allow ownership of real estate for individuals, foreign and local. So it's 100% uh, allowed uh, in Saudi Arabia, especially in Camp Abdel Rahman City. The biggest opportunity today, actually, is why, uh, th which is why I'm here um, in the Valley, is around IoT, the Internet of Things, this concept of smart city, and the concept we're launching of a perfect home. Since I joined in 2008, people have been talking about smart cities. Right? How many of you heard of a smart city? Okay. How many of you have seen a smart city? Okay. And the problem with the, with, with the concept is authority diffusion, if you will. There's nobody can make the decision. It is different authorities. Technology risk, who's going to take the risk if you're in government? I don't, you don't want to do an implementation. Most of them you can't bid out because it's unique technology, right? So how do you price it in a public tender? So you can't make decisions. And the big companies are selling the equipment, so they're not really your advisors, right? And so we've decided that now after the port is operational and the industrial zone is successful and we have our residential, that this is an area we will focus on. Um, in the next 24 months, actually implementing the smart city model. So I've been here talking to companies in the Valley about changing the experience for a resident in the city, empowering them to actually run the city through technology. Right? So you need the, obviously the fiber network and all of the goodies that come with a smart city, but it's more about how do you actually operate the city? How do I know within my home not only how much energy I'm using, but which of my appliances is least efficient, which one I would, how, why can't my app just calculate which one I should buy on a business case basis? If I remove that iron and buy another one, it will pay for itself in seven months or two years or three years. I mean, that's, can be instantaneous, if you will. So there are so many ideas we're looking at. For example, the idea of that smart fridge. Anybody heard about the smart fridge? Hmm? It knows exactly how much you have in it. Obviously, nobody's going to develop that, right? And it can be very simple. Wh what if I scanned everything? That just a scanner on my uh, appli uh, on my iPhone, right? Just a scanner of all of the items that I have, and every time I use one, I just scan it again. It tells me exactly what I'm missing, what I need. It can contact Amazon, a drone can fly in. No, but the idea is, how can we be practical about it? The other project is we're, 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 the, the initiative we're launching is the perfect home. And the perfect home is trying to optimize a home for aesthetics, technology, sustainability. But the trick is to do it at the middle income level, because you can scale. It's easy to build the next greatest home with all of the bells and whistles of technology, right? But that will not be affordable and not scalable. The trick is to optimize for a middle income home. That way, when you go to affordable, you can just cut, uh, cut you know, remove some of the, t the options. And when you go to high end, you can just add more options. So we're launching that also with many companies in the Valley. So these are the big opportunities for me. Who has the mic? I have the mic. Uh, <laughs> thank you there so are much. two mics. What's going on? No. At the same time? Okay, I'll leave. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for coming here. Thank At you. the GSB, we always hear about the importance of culture, but I don't think I've had an opportunity to ask anyone, what is it like to shape the culture of a city, and if, is that something you do, and how do you do it, specifically in the context of Saudi Arabia, which has a pretty highly defined culture? Yeah. Okay. I'm really good at knowing what I'm not good at. Okay. And uh, definitely social engineering is not an agenda uh, of mine. 
Uh, it's tempting to do it, but the reality, you, real, you realize that actually um, people who move at the beginning to a city will shape its culture. Uh, they will have their own dynamic. All you can do is not get in the way. Um, the, the, the thing we are trying to instill, though, is citizenship through engagement. Uh, the, the, the idea that this is your city. It's not mine. It's not our employees. It is the resident city. And so we launched uh, an app. Um, many of you might have used it um, called Public Works. Basically allows you to, um, if you see a pothole in the street or something that's not working, you can send it immediately and we will actually track that. Uh, and how long it takes our people to go actually and fix it. So it gives you a sense of ownership that you can actually, that you are the mayor of the city. That we don't have a mayor, you are the mayor. So that kind of engagement is very important in terms of how, how citizens feel and uh, about the city and about the efficiency of its operations. I'd like to shift gears slightly, actually. Uh, if I remember your presentation correctly, you said you joined Amara at the age of 30, and yeah. despite having an MBA from what is unquestionably the best business school in the world, <laughs> uh, you are a really young leader in charge of a really big project. So I'm curious if that you face any challenges because of that, and then what you did to establish credibility as a young leader in a new organization. Yeah. Uh, it was actually a big challenge uh, because um, I had no engineering background. Um, I've never built, like I said, anything before in my life. I had a, uh, a finance background, so I did lots of modeling, and the biggest challenge at the time was the business model would work. And really, it's uh, about leadership, realizing that you know, I'm not supposed to be building every sector of the city, and the challenge is can you attract the talent to allow you to get this know-how and actually to build the best of the best. So the example of... You know, I've, I've met many Silicon Valley companies during this trip over the past two days, and they all say, okay, how are you going to do it? I said, I, I'm not going to do it. I, well, that's why I'm here. I'm supposed to be working with the best of the best, so why should I come and, and try to reinvent the wheel on something you're already doing? And so the idea is how can you make decisions on who to work with, how to attract talent companies and people, by the way. It's not only about people, individuals. Um, and the third is around getting people to accept your decisions. Because in this, you'll make lots of mistakes. Lots of mistakes. And in a public com uh, company, this could be actually very dangerous for an executive. So the idea is about being transparent with, you know, in the, this case, my board, our employees, about the kind of risk we are taking and the potential outcomes. So you go back to decision trees and uh, and analysis, and actually we just you know, um, make mistakes all the time. But if you're making 100 decisions and three of them go wrong, uh, you hope that the, those are not the three big ones that you made. But, but you, you, you create a culture of learning. And uh, to be honest, that's uh, learning by doing. And this has been the hardest thing, because you get employees from different companies who are not used to it, and they judge each other. Yeah, they say, look, he made a mistake, should be fired. This is the way people are used to doing it. And I say, look, you know, if we do one, one of these examples, you know, obviously if they weren't di diligent, that's something else. But if they actually had made the diligent effort, looked at all aspects, and just the market didn't, didn't turn out the way they expected it, then that's okay. You make one of these decisions. You fire one person because they make a made a market decision, and then you will kill innovation in an organization because people just don't want to take risk anymore. So we try to avoid that as much as possible. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, my question is to, to the purpose of the city again. And you mentioned that 23% you know, of the global freight volumes, I think, kind of go right by, yeah. right by that, that, that city, um, which is great. Um, but they go right by the city without the city even being in existence. So yeah. once the city is there, once you have a top 10 port worldwide, um, how are you going to take part in, in that, in that, in that uh, logistics flow? How are you going to improve it? Um, well, you know, you ta I talked about capacity. By the way, our capacity is already full because the shipping lines um, are already moving to Kenya Abdullah Economic City. Two of the top sh five shipping lines around the world are coming here because they told us that they need a port on the Red Sea. Um, so ports work like big airports. You know the hub and spoke model? It's the same thing. It doesn't matter what size of the port it is. It, what matters is which airlines go there. 
Uh, and so the idea is this will be a hub and then you'll get smaller container ships serving all of the countries around us. So that, that's the basic idea. There's time for one last question. Hi, my, uh, my question was, um, you talked about in 10 years you wanted to think about how you're going to feel. How did you pick the industry that you were going to work in? Because that's a big question that yeah. I always hear. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. I, uh, you're going to laugh. I did a spreadsheet. And I uh, you know, tried to optimize all of my opportunities along the make an impact, make enough money so I don't have to worry about it. You know, and I, every decision was just, and that's the condition I wanted to be. In 10 years, I, I wanted to be in a place where I had major impact, where uh, you know, I, I was learning, having fun, and that I was financially secure. Uh, honestly, that, that was it. And then I, every opportunity that ever came, I just said, OK, how, how, how does it get me closer? And you have to prioritize, because it's nice to have everything. But you have to say, this is next. And I, and I learned that, again, it's about the, uh, not taking the path of least resistance. That's the most dangerous thing. Um, because it might seem like you're taking a lot more risk at the beginning, but turns out that at that age, you could take it and still survive. It is later in life that you can't take these big risks. So you know, I'm not encouraging you to take risks per se. I'm just saying, in my example, um, taking the right risks ultimately has developed uh, my character, has given me more experience, because I, I, I just worked harder earlier on, and that has resulted in me being in a place where, honestly, I, I would have never had imagined uh, doing, uh, doing this before. So. Please join me in thanking Mr. Thank you so much.